Hi, this is Theory Station and I'm John Duggan. This program is called the Rational Choice Modeling Program. Uh, the series that we're just starting is called the Basic Formal Theory Toolkit. This is the first installment in the series. Um, in this installment, what I want to do is um, talk a bit about mathematical modeling in general and then about a specific model, kind of the most basic model uh, that you need to know when you're doing mathematical modeling in economics or political science. Um, those two areas are um, sort of what I specialize in. Uh, my training is in both economics and political science. And from my perspective, there are a number of just you know really basic uh, bread and butter models that you just need to know, you need to master before you can start doing research in these areas um, and before you can start reading uh, published articles. Um, these models are um, they're kind of canonical. They are super flexible, um, useful models. Uh, not just in and of themselves, but when you go on to do more advanced modeling, you're usually building on these things in some way. Uh, so having a, a mastery of the basic models is really essential. In this series, I just want to give, you know, from my perspective, what those basic models are. Um, I'm, well, not all of them, but at least a few of them. And, um, and in this installment, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the model of preference and choice. Which is really it's like the most basic model that you need to know uh, when you you're doing theoretical economics or political science. Um, before I get to that, let me just say a few words about the exercise of mathematical modeling in general that I think uh, applies beyond just the areas that I work in. Um, so the way I think about it is when we're modeling, there's something in reality that we're interested in. And, um, you know, it's complicated and messy, and I'm going to represent it by this blob. And um, in fact, there's a process that's going on that we want to understand. And, and so this first blob here is um, some antecedent conditions or initial conditions. And then there's some process that leads to um, some outcomes also in reality and also messy and I'm going to use another blob over here to represent that. So, um, you know, this is all going on in the real world. This arrow that I just drew is super complicated. Um, anything that's really interesting is complicated. And um, in fact, in the real world, there's so many moving parts and so many details, uh, we can't really comprehend things in full detail. So um, the math ma mathematical modeling enterprise is, um, well, approaches this by, instead of trying to understand reality directly, we represent it in terms of some model, which I'll represent in this diagram with some nice box. Um, this arrow, this representation arrow, is an important part of the modeling enterprise. Um, it's, uh, but it's hard to, it's not something that I can really convey uh, at a whiteboard. This is something that, um, that you really learn from practice, uh, from applying, uh, from, from doing mathematical modeling yourself or doing it with someone and there's some art to this arrow. Um, there's also, you find sometimes that um, there's learning as well, like you'll write down a model and then um, realize later that, no, this model's not doing quite what I need it to do. 
um, and you go back and you revise the model, you improve it and generalize it. So this arrow is, is there's a lot packed into that arrow. At any rate, we're going to represent reality by some mathematical model. And this model will be made up of um, mathematical parts like sets and uh, functions and relations. Um, this model should um, it should capture the essential features of reality of whatever it is you're trying to understand. Um, but there's some abstraction here, right? Because we're in the process of simplifying, we're leaving out some detail. And, um, you know, it's not always that straightforward to figure out, you know, how do we capture those essential aspects? Anyway, that's an important step. Once we have the model written down, then um, we can apply formal methods to draw some conclusions from the model. And um, this arrow here is our uh, formal analysis arrow. And um, that's going to involve logic as an essential part of that. Um, and there's, you know, tools for mathematics like calculus, real analysis, linear algebra, and so on. The list goes on and on. Um, right, so we apply those tools and we reach conclusions which, which can be uh, mathematical theorems, uh, they can be testable hypotheses, um, but they are, um, well, they're conclusions that are, uh, you know, telling us something about this process in reality that we're interested in. Um, and these are going to have some implications. And um, hopefully this whole diagram commutes in some way. Hopefully there's some correspondence between those implications and the outcomes that you're interested in. Um, so that's, a, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm being ambiguous about what those implications are or what that correspondence is. Um, and that's because it really kind of depends on how you're using the model and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, there's different ways of using mathematical models. I'll just mention um, two main uses uh, of mathematical modeling, um, broadly speaking. And within each of these, there's also different nuances. But uh, the first use is probably what most people think about, which is um, positive analysis, which is essentially predictive. Um, so, you know, your model succeeds if it's able to generate predictions that are accurate, um, uh, possibly in a stochastic way, but still, it's telling us what will happen. Um, the other use is normative. Normative analysis is, um, is telling us not what will happen, but what should happen in some sense. Okay, so it's not, instead of being predictive, it's prescriptive. Um, of course, you'll probably notice that um, what should happen is a subjective thing. Um, and that's correct. And so in this normative approach um, is part of the modeling exercise, you have to specify what you mean by that. So, um, you know, you, you need to specify some measure of um, normative acceptability uh, or some, you know, that can be in the form of a, an objective function that you're trying to maximize or minimize. Um, it can be a measure of efficiency. Um, and there's also a, a, a way of doing this instead of using a, a, a kind of functional uh, 
criterion, you're using uh, axiomatic criteria. So there's an axiomatic approach to normative analysis. And anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, so now I want to uh, just jump into this model of preference and choice. Again, it's like the most basic model that you um, would need to know uh, to do modeling in economics or political science. So um, in this model of preference and choice, um, the starting point is, uh, well, we have a decision maker. I'm not actually going to put them in the model because that's just kind of implicit. Um, but what I am going to start with is a, um, a set, a number of options for the decision maker. Um, I'm going to represent that with a set, and um, I'll use this notation, uh, I'll use x. This is going to be the set of conceivable choices for the decision maker. Okay. Um, so that can, you know, could be a lot of things, um, but just to put some meat on the bones over here on the right, let me just give a simple example um, and suppose that um, we have a decision maker and um, let's say they're going to just choose, um, you know, from five different possible things. Um, so this could be, um, you know, five possible candy bars. It could be five candidates in an election. Um, it could be five policies. But let's just call them A, B, C, D, and E. And I just won't try to give them specific names. Um, so our set of conceivable choices would be these five things, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, the way I'm going to uh, describe a set in terms of you know, just notation is I'm going to list the elements, that is the members of that set, A, B, C, D, and E, and I'm going to put them between these curly braces. That is our set of conceivable choices for the decision maker in this example. The next thing we need is, um, I mean, that's a model right there, but it's pretty boring. Um, it's just a set of things. Um, eventually what I want to talk about is how a decision maker chooses from this set. So um, in economics and political science, we approach this from a rational choice perspective, which means we're going to think about the decision maker as having some preferences and those describe the motivations of the decision maker. The decision maker is making a choice um, to get the best thing they can. Okay, so Part of this model needs to describe the preferences of the decision maker. Uh, so the next thing will be a list of preferences for the decision maker. And um, I'm going to use P for that list, P for preference. And over here in my um, little example with the five conceivable choices. Um, well, let's say, um, let's do, uh, let's say the, the decision maker prefers A to B, A to C, A to D, a to E, in other words, it prefers A to everything. It prefers B to C. Um, actually, I was not going to do that. Uh, sorry, B to D, B to E, C to D, and C to E. And that's it. All right, that's a long list. And that was kind of a pain. Um, in fact, there, if you think about it, 
there's a more efficient way to describe this list of preferences um, because I've actually described a decision maker with a particular ranking of these choices. Uh, a is preferred to everything else. I'm going to put that at the top of the ranking. B and C are both preferred to D and E. Um, D and E are not preferred to anything, so they're going to be at the bottom of the ranking. B and C are in the middle. Um, this would actually be a much more efficient way of describing uh, this person's preferences rather than write out that list. And uh, we'll do that. Um, we would never actually write out the list of preferences the way I did at first. We would just describe the ranking. Or, you know, there's even other ways of doing it. So at this point, um, well, we, we're almost done here. We have a set of conceivable choices for the decision maker. We have preferences for the decision maker. So we know, um, you know, what they should be choosing. And so um, I'm just going to add something that's usually implicit in rational choice modeling. I'll call it the optimality principle. which is that the decision maker chooses the best thing they can. Okay. Um, that's, I guess, where the rational uh, term comes in, uh, comes from in rational choice modeling. This is something that's not usually stated in a rational choice model, it's just understood. Um, but the way I think about it is, um, so if this was a, a car, um, our set of conceivable choices, our list of preferences, that's like, you know, the, um, well, that's the body of the car, the trunk, the tires, the gas tank. The optimality principle is the ignition system that actually makes it go, and it gives us a prediction, right? And specifically, let's suppose the decision maker can choose anything from these conceivable choices. The optimality principle then is gonna say, well, they choose the best thing they can. That is A. It's a prediction that comes out of the model. Um, so that's like a very first, um, you know, sticking our toes in the water of mathematical modeling. Um, this is a super basic model. And, um, you know, you're not going to open up a, a published article and see this model exactly, but you're going to see models that build on it. Um, and we'll also build on that um, in the next installment.